I wish Muslims could experience what I did when I was first introduced to Islam. Obviously, that's not possible, so let me try to explain. Years ago, before I had read a single word of an Islamic source, I watched several debates between Christians and Muslims. The Muslim apologists differed on some very important points. However, they were all in agreement on one thing. The Bible is corrupted. Ultimately, however, the disagreements among Muslim debaters prompted me to look at the Islamic sources for myself. I had absolutely no idea what I would find except for one thing. I was ready to read over and over and over in the Quran that the Bible is corrupted, since I had heard it over and over and over again from Muslim apologists. Imagine my surprise when my presuppositions about what the Quran would say about the Bible were proven wrong by the Quran. The Quran never, a single time, affirms the corruption of the biblical text, as Muslims commonly believe. The closest it comes is saying some have concealed verses, tried to pass off writings as scripture, or misinterpreted the scriptures. In fact, the Quran claims over and over and over that it affirms the previous scriptures and encourages its Jewish and Christian hearers to abide by the Torah and Gospel, respectively. But how could Muslim apologists consistently say something that contradicted the Quran? As I've continued my studies in Islam, I've become increasingly aware of the fact that Muslims do not ultimately care what the Quran says. Oh yes, the Quran is their supreme authority, but only when it agrees with their traditional beliefs. When it doesn't, the vast majority of Muslims don't give a rip about what the Quran says. In this video, we'll look at the top 10 ways Muslims show us they don't care about the Quran. We've already been introduced to the first one, the Bible is corrupted. Muslims, I know this is difficult for you, but forget about your traditions and listen to what the Quran says. To begin, Muslims want to separate the Torah, Gospel, and Quran and set the Quran on a pedestal above the rest. The Quran, however, does not do this. According to the Quran, the Torah and Gospel are part of the prior revelations, which are all part of what the Quran ultimately calls the book, the mother of the book, or the reminder. The Quran is clearly just part of the entire revelation of Allah, and it claims to be in agreement with the other revelations. The people who already have the book know that the Quran is sent down in truth in Surah 6. Surah 46 states that the Quran confirms the book of Moses, and Surah 3 claims the Quran affirms both the Torah and the Gospel. The problems the Quran presents for Muslims who want to claim the Bible is corrupted can be illustrated like this. In Surah 6, you can see two books, one referring, of course, to the Quran in blue, and the other sent down, which is likely referring to the Torah in brown. What do they have in common? They're collectively referred to as the words of Allah, and nobody can change his words. In Surah 46, you have two books mentioned, the Book of Moses in blue and the Quran in brown. The Quran is said to confirm the Book of Moses. If the Book of Moses is corrupted, then the Quran is confirming a corrupted book and is therefore corrupt itself. In Surah 3, you have three books mentioned, the Torah and Gospel in blue and the Quran in brown. The Quran is said to confirm the Torah and Gospel. If the Torah and Gospel are corrupted, then the Quran is confirming corrupted books and is therefore corrupt itself. And finally, Allah says he is the guardian of the reminder. He doesn't explain at all what that means or how he will guard the reminder. Nevertheless, the phrase the reminder is also used of the prior scriptures as well. Notice that in Surah 21.7, the phrase followers of the reminder follows an inclusive statement. We did not send before you any but men to whom we sent revelation. At a minimum, this would have to include the Torah and the Gospel, since the Quran regards them as prior revelations. Therefore, the people of the reminder would have to include the people who follow the Torah and Gospel. Therefore, the reminder has to include the Torah and Gospel. They are all parts of the whole. Naturally, since the Quran sees all of these revelations in agreement and coming from the same source, the Quran is also called the reminder in Surah 59. However, what Muslims want to do is separate these revelations, contrary to the Quran, and interpret Surah 15.9 as Allah guarding only the Quran. However, Allah didn't say he would guard just one third of the reminder. He said he would guard the reminder. Muslims then arbitrarily state that this applies only to the Quran, and contrary to the Quran, claim the prior revelations have been corrupted. Number two, why is Muhammad so important in Islamic tradition? In the Quran, Muhammad is only mentioned by name a handful of times. In fact, he's almost completely overshadowed by other prophets like Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, all mentioned much more by name than Muhammad. 
Muhammad is also eclipsed by other Quranic themes like the history of the former people or the judgment of Allah. In the Quran, he's mostly assumed to be synonymous with the nebulous messenger figure. Scholars have noticed for a long time the very different portrayals of Muhammad in the Quran and Hadith. Over the years, Muslims have been quite creative at not only distinguishing the messenger from the others, but in elevating him in various ways. In doing so, they contradict the Quran. Number three, my favorite, the miraculous Muhammad. The Quran states over and over and over that no signs were sent down with a messenger and that he was just a plain warner. You can pause the screen and read those verses, or you can go to my video on the miraculous Muhammad. But of course, we all know that numerous miracles are attributed to Muhammad in later sources. Muhammad made water gush out of his fingers. He multiplied food. He had miraculous spit and urine and the earth split open to swallow his feces. Everything about Muhammad in later traditions is miraculous, unlike the Quran where nothing is. But Muslims don't care about their scripture. They would rather exalt their prophet. Number four, Muhammad doesn't know the future in the Quran. This is stated over and over and over as well. The future, part of the unseen, is unknown by the messenger. The unseen is only for Allah. You can go to Muslim websites and see all of the predictions that Muhammad made, according to later sources. Why is that? Well, Muslims don't care about contradicting the Quran as long as it exalts their prophet. Number five, Muhammad is called the holy prophet. I see this all over the place on Muslim websites. This is quite shocking, actually. In the entire Quran, Allah is called holy only twice, Surah 59.23 and 62.1. But we can look at a couple of samples from a popular Muslim Q&A website. This question calls Muhammad holy four times, this one seven times. Together, these two questions use the term holy for Muhammad over twice as much as the entire Quran uses it for Allah. But Muslims don't let the Quran get in the way of exalting your prophet above your God. Number six, Muslims emphasize Muhammad's supposed genealogy from Ishmael, but not the Quran. The prophetic office and book comes through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ishmael is not included. Regarding Muhammad's genealogy, the Quran couldn't be less interested. Notice how Jesus, for example, is the son of Mary. The Quran frequently gives such descriptions of its characters, but Muhammad's ancestry is completely omitted. The Quran could not have less interest in linking Muhammad to Ishmael or anyone else for that matter. The interest in Muhammad's genealogy is a later development. Number seven, Quranic geography. The Quran describes the setting and surroundings of its hearers, mentioning gardens, gushing springs, livestock, date palms, olives, and all kinds of fruit. The Quran also describes its hearers as living among the ruins of ancient cities and mentions the mother of towns, an ancient name for Petra in Jordan. The Quran's descriptions obviously look very different from modern-day Mecca and Medina, but Muslims don't let the Quran get in the way of your traditions. Number eight, bro, do you even know Arabic? The vast majority of Muslims can't read classical Arabic. The logic here seems to be that if you want to believe in Islam, you don't need to know classical Arabic. However, if you want to critique Islam, you need to. Seems inconsistent to me, but even if all Muslims could read classical Arabic, it wouldn't be all they needed to know. The pure Arabic of the Quran is in fact constructed from multiple languages. This is well known among Muslim scholars. Suyuti, the famous 15th century Egyptian scholar, compiled a list of over 100 foreign words within the Quranic text from about 11 different languages. Work on foreign words in the Quran continues by modern scholars, but for most, all of this is smoothed out because of the veneration Muslims have for the Arabic language. Arabic is the language of Allah, and pure Arabic is what the Quran is written in, or so they think. If Muslims actually took the text of the Quran into account, their question would be more like, bro, do you even know classical Arabic, Aramaic, Hebrew, Coptic, Syriac, Akkadian, and Nabataean? But somehow that question just doesn't seem as effective. Number nine, Muhammad came to bring monotheism to the pagan Arabs? I don't think so. The messenger's earliest teaching consisted of warning of what he thought was impending judgment. However, none of this ever came true, so it's been suppressed by Muslims and replaced with Tawheed as the messenger's most important proclamation. Thus, a large part of the Quran is ignored due to the embarrassment of the projected events never happening. Number 10, the Quran itself. The Quran is not a transcendent divine revelation. It's a product of its time, a composite of pre-Islamic pagan beliefs, rabbinic tradition, legends, Jewish mystical texts, apocryphal gospels, and more. 
I have discussed a number of these topics in depth on this channel. Additionally, the Quran arose in a biblically illiterate milieu, where its authors thought many of its sources were prior scriptures, and thus claimed to confirm them. The Quran both borrows from and hopelessly garbles its sources, passing them on to its hearers as Allah's action in human history. The Quran is, as its original hearers identified, tales of the ancients, which were Islamicized and incorporated into what would later become known as the eternal word of Allah. Any Muslim willing to study the religion of Islam apart from the limits of orthodoxy will realize that it is a religion of tradition. Once that tradition is stripped away, there's nothing left but the Quran itself, which frequently disagrees with and contradicts the traditions that obscure it. But a Muslim who is truly searching will then find that the Quran cannot stand on its own, which is the reason for all of that tradition in the first place, and it cannot possibly occupy the place it claims, namely, being in line with the prior scriptures it claims to confirm. I'll see you next time.